Okay, so uh, our, our paper here, it's about theorizing an institutional dichotomy of conflict and cooperation around international water management between the US and Mexico. Uh, in a little bit fewer words, uh, we're gonna talk about the idea of water conflict and cooperation, both uh, the discourse that it's used in, how it's applied practically, um, and some of our thoughts, both positive and negative on, on that type of conversation. So I enjoyed this quote. It's, it's not from an academic paper. It's from an article in The Economist. Um, and it says, it has become a cliche of doom mongering. Future wars will be over water. So um, I'm sure all of us have come across works that, that refer to water wars, and especially in more arid regions. Uh, we read about that in Linton as well. Um, but we take a lot of inspiration from Aaron Wolf, and, and his work is what kind of got us interested in this idea of why is conflict highlighted over cooperation. So his research is specifically on trans transboundary water conflict. Um, and, and what he found is he did this kind of massive quantification project of all the different types of agreements or conflicts uh, that have happened uh, about trans transboundary water and found that there's actually a lot more cooperation that happens, um, very significantly so. Uh, and that this is really overshadowed by uh, this fixation or this discourse uh, that, you know, scarce water resources will lead to water wars or water conflict. And just to be clear, when he is referring to water conflict, he does mean more of an armed conflict. So we'll make that distinction here. Okay. So. So every project evolves. Um, so we did be begin with uh, Wolf's research, but then the, you know, the question begs, um, you know, what effect does governance have on this water conflict? Why does water conflict evolve? Because um, certainly there's more to conflict than just armed conflicts. Um, so what we found with, uh, in our literature review is, you know, a lot of the research agrees that the level of scarcity is, is not equivalent to the level of conflict. Um, other authors, Giselles and Wooden, they say that this value of the value of quantifying conflict versus cooperation is pretty limited, um, and that you know why? Okay, sure, it's you know it's not necessarily good for the media or academic literature to fixate on uh, water wars, um, but that the more you know the more appropriate conversation is what effect uh, governance can have on avoiding conflict. So uh, just another article from Richards, uh, you know, the point here is not that, or is that conflict doesn't arise from water scarcity, but from a poor governance, governance response to water scarcity. So we can think of this um, summarized as water conflict as a governance failure. So, and when I say governance failure, I mean it in the same context um, that we read about in privatizing water. Okay. So part of the reason that water scarcity can result in conflict is the issue of stakeholder representation and governance. So Wester and, and all finds that some general principles about stakehold, stakeholder involvement in water governance um, are that democratization of governance reduces the likelihood of water conflict um, and that there is often a very superficial amount of stakeholder participation. We really need to move away from that towards uh, a more substantive rep representation uh, and that in very much the same way that um, you know Linton's idea of modern water has a tendency to blame water or blame nature uh, for scarcity um, that the discourse of water scarcity as a threat of water wars that it's that it's water's fault um, hides uh, these realities of poor governance or of unequal water access or of unequal control. So uh, Zaytun, I think is how it's pronounced, but Zaytun and a number of collaborators uh, kind of take this critical hydropolitical perspective. This is a new, new phrase to me as of this research paper, but uh, the critical hydropolitical approach is uh, fairly consistent uh, but with you know, the, the relational approach or the contextual approach. Uh, it doesn't see conflict and cooperation as necessarily things that cannot exist simultaneously, 
Um, in fact, Zaytun argues that creating this false dichotomy takes away from the actual debate and understanding of a situation, the nuance. Um, so what he calls water interactions um, are a political process. Um, and one of his arguments that's not in some of the authors I've discussed already is that uh, cooperation is not always a great goal to have um, because cooperation is you know, not always successful in addressing the actual water concerns. So uh, I, I put a quote from one of his, one of his papers here that you know, what appears to be cooperation can sometimes be much closer to coercion. Uh, an example here might be uh, if you think of water relations between Israel and Palestine. So officially there's cooperation there. They have a joint water commission um, and they've signed a few deals over, even over recent years, including for a pretty large proposed works of a desalination plant and a pipeline. Um, so in Wolf's study, this would be considered a cooperation event. Um, but in reality, you know, there's extreme discrepancy over the power dynamics um, in this situation. Um, and that heavily influences Palestine's ability to negotiate. Uh, Israel controls about 80% of groundwater in that region, in the Jordan River Basin. And so, you know, while Wolf may have found that you know, cooperation is underrepresent, underrepresented, uh, Zaytun finds that cooperation can be a little bit misleading. So this chart that you see um, on the bottom of this slide here is just a summary of some of the dynamics in the Jordan River Basin, kind of making the point that it's very difficult to say that the situation there is truly a cooperation. Okay, so uh, I just wanna wrap up this sort of mini literature review before I turn it over to Corey. Um, and we looked at about 10 different, of, 10 different authors who are you know, really involved in this cooperation versus conflict uh, discourse, uh, both in thinking about the binary that presents um, or tearing down the binary that it presents. Uh, but these are the key points from the literature review. So some of this um, I've summarized already and, and some are things that we've also garnered from our other readings. Okay, so first, you know, conflict is wrongly highlighted over cooperation, um, especially in kind of the fear mongering around water wars. Um, and as we've discussed in class as well, there is an, uh, an element of discrimination in that conversation as well. Um, but cooperation isn't necessarily the best outcome either. It can really solidify um, existing inequalities and kind of mask underlying issues. It is pretty much agreed upon uh, across the board from the authors that we looked at that democratization does improve how equitable the outcome is. Um, and that substantive stakeholder representation is very essential to that successful outcome. Water politics, power and control, as we just saw on the table of the Georgian River Basin as an example, uh, also will affect whether uh, cooperation or conflict happen or somewhere in between. Um, and we can say we're defining water conflict um, as, a, as a form of governance failure. And so just as a last thought here, you know, water cooperation is not a success if it doesn't help the stakeholders. And as we move forward, we're gonna use a critical hydropolitical, a contextual, a relational perspective to gain a more nuanced understanding of why water scarcity results in water conflict, cooperation, or somewhere in between. So Corey's gonna give you a case study. Um, and Corey, if you just tell me when you want me to turn the slide, I will. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the, the challenge here was to try and apply a contextual perspective or analytic framework to uh, an issue of transboundary water governance. And uh, the challenge was finding a governance institution that had a divergent um, outcome of water management. So we chose a case study at the US-Mexico um, border basically in two transboundary basins, the Colorado River and the Rio Grande River that are both governed by the um, International Boundary and Water Commission. Next slide, please. The, the International Boundary and Water Commission was established after, uh, you know, as a result of the Spanish-American War, 
1898 to kind of work on border demarcation between the US and Mexico because the Rio Grande creates the border with um, Texas uh, uh, along the Chihuahuan Desert. So the rivers are situated in similar climate regimes. They're both in, in the American West. Um, and since uh, the uh, you know, end of the Spanish-American War, there have been a similar number of transboundary water treaties uh, on each river. So the Rio Grande has had 44, and the Colorado, Colorado River has had um, 47. And it was in the year 1944 that the IBWC, the International Boundary Water Commission, excuse me, set the contemporary water allocations that are um, more or less work, you know, as, as the uh, serve as the benchmark today. So next slide. Both basins deal with severe water scarcity. This is a screen grab from a very recent article about um, drought in in the region that would affect both basins, right? So so what I'm what I want to highlight in this slide is that the climate region and the risk of water scarcity is just as severe across each basin. Next slide, please. From a, con from a, from a, re a rational or a positivist or, a, or an institutional perspective, if we just looked at the IBWC, we would see that, you know, it's two of the same countries sharing rivers. Uh, it's the same governance institution. Treaties exist across the same time frame. There's a similar number of them. The climate is similar and water scarcity is, is an equal threat in both catchments. Um, but what we, thank you, what we need to understand here is, is um, a contextual analysis of what's going on in each river. So we, we wanted to take a Lejano type approach using kind of a critical lens of like power dynamics in the region to look at how um, governance outcomes uh, exist in the um, in each transboundary basin today. Uh, so that's what we're going to do, and we're going to do it. Next slide. Using the transboundary freshwater dispute database. So this is uh, work, the results of Aaron Wolf, um, who we mentioned at the top of this presentation, and it records transboundary um, events uh, or events of transboundary freshwater cooperation or dispute. Um, and it's uh, an exhaustive database. Unfortunately, it was only most recently updated in um, 2008. So for the scope of this paper, we're going to kind of be um, a little bit out of date because we're, we're relying on this database. But what it, what it does is tabulates events, um, say, the, the Mexico filing a lawsuit uh, in US courts against a proposed development plan um, on the US side of the border that would affect Mexican access to water, for example, that would be recorded in the database. And what um, Professor Wolf does is they develop this risk metric. Next slide, I think, yes. And the basin at risk scale describes to what degree each event might fall between the two bookends of conflict and cooperation. So we've, we're now treating conflict and cooperation as kind of a, a continuum. And we have these qualitative like descriptions of what a, uh, a basin risk might look like. So the lowest value of minus seven would be a formal declaration of war. So we're going to war over water. Whereas the highest value would be a unification into one nation. Um, so obviously we're not going to see that at the U.S.-Mexico border in our time frame, but we are going to see some interesting things going um, on, on either sides of the, of the basin at risk scale. Okay, um, next slide. I'm showing here the most recent um, entries into the transboundary dispute database for the Colorado River. And in the second column, you can see that our BAR, the basin at risk scale is negative. So they're indicating there's some degree of tension, diplomatic um, conflict that's happening. And what I've, what I've highlighted in the third row in the most um, recent entry from the database actually 
is that the United States made a, a disingenuous move to violate a treaty of the International Border um, and Water Commission between the two countries. And that, that served to um, hegemonize part of the water resource that wasn't necessarily accounted for in the treaty. So I'll show, um, I'll describe that a little bit in this next slide. This is a, a Google Earth high resolution satellite image of the US-Mexico border. And what's striking about this, that's the, um, below the black line are large agricultural fields on the, um, on the Mexican side of the border. And what's interesting about this agriculture, it's basically complete desert. But if you can see, um, maybe you could switch to the next, the next slide. Yeah, so you can see that this canal is running across the American, excuse me, the American side of the border, and that's called the All-American Canal. So I've, I've shown the All-American Canal in, um, in this image, and then also the concrete lined replacement. The All-American Canal, you can see bushes kind of growing in the channel. There was no concrete lining. So water that flowed through this canal unintentionally on the US's part seeped into the ground and recharged aquifers. And it served as a vital groundwater resource for farmers on the, on the Mexican side of the border. The conflict that we showed in the transboundary freshwater dispute database was with regards to the, the replacement of the unlined All-American Canal with a concrete lined replacement that um, basically eliminated the seepage to the aquifer that Mexican farmers were depending on. So we are left with the Colorado River in a state of diplomatic tension, right? Without getting into all of the um, minutia of the political details, the, the state of Mexico or the country of Mexico sued the United States um, in coordination with some environmental nonprofits over this construction project, eventually lost. The U.S. Um, built the canal and there remains some tension over the Colorado River, not to mention that the river basically doesn't drain to the Gulf because it's completely dry by the time it gets there. Um, that's an issue we'll leave. Meanwhile, along the Rio Grande, there is scarcity, um, there's drought, um, but there is collaboration at a more local level. So the, the cities of Juarez and El Paso have actually worked um, for the past couple of decades on building scientific and managerial collaboration on water resources. And I think that this has played out <clears throat> more broadly across the, the Rio Grande um, in terms of how much conflict or cooperation we see there uh, recorded in the transboundary freshwater dispute database. Next slide. Um, where we have relative cooperation expressed um, through kind of working together on achieving some type of resilience to water scarcity, right? So I've highlighted in this table, um, these are entries, the most recent entries for the Rio Grande. And in the third column, I'm just showing that, or sorry, the third, um, third column and the third row, progress has been accomplished on boundary water distribution. We have a BAR score of two, okay? So it's a little positive. We're, we're, we're towards more of a cooperative end. Okay, what is the next slide? So now that we've expanded our institutional or um, rational inquiry into a, a contextual one, we see different outcomes on the Rio Grande versus the Colorado River. Although the governance institution is the same, water scarcity is a similar threat, um, they're in a similar climate regime, on the Rio Grande, there's some type of collaboration. Um, the flows are, are better maintained than they are on the Colorado River. And there's some recent history of joint infrastructure and joint political projects, albeit there has been some conflict and there has been a little bit of um, inability to meet 
flow demands on time. Um, but most of those things have been resolved as far as I can tell. Meanwhile, on the Colorado River, the US actively moves to dominate the scarce resource. Um, and the example of that we showed is from the replacement of the All-American Canal with the concrete lined one. Um, this compromises the river habitat downstream. It creates a diplomatic tension that is still active. Um, and there are water quality and quantity issues um, that the state of Mexico continues to complain about in terms of the U.S. delivery of Colorado River water to the state, to, to Mexico. Next slide. So now, now we need to theorize what, what can cause this um, apparent dichotomy with the same governance institution, uh, the same countries, the same climate. We have a divergent outcome. The Rio Grande is a bit more cooperatively managed despite the scarcity it faces where each party, the US and Mexico kind of works to deliver their portion of agreed upon flows, sometimes later than expected. Um, and we're gonna kind of work toward the, the, the argument that Mexico might have more negotiating power over the Rio Grande River governance. But in the Colorado River, there are continued management issues. There is poor quality and low quantity of water delivered to Mexico. And the US makes kind of hostile moves to monopolize the scarce resources, something that um, Mark Zaytoun would call hydrohegemony or Neil Smith might call uh, spatial injustice. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. And I wanna highlight here how much more of the Rio Grande Mexico controls than the Colorado River. Mexico, the, a large portion of the drainage, oh, um, yeah, so a large portion of the drainage of the Rio Grande is, is actually in Mexico, Mexican territory, whereas almost none of the drainage basin for the Colorado River is in um, Mexican territory. So the, the state of Mexico is almost entirely dependent on U.S. goodwill to deliver flows from the Colorado River, but it actually has some power, some power based on its geographic relationship to the river, um, we'll argue, that enables kind of more cooperative management of the Rio Grande Belt or more sustainable management. So to summarize the case study in the last slide, I think, um, we will make a contextual argument for the divergence between governance outcomes um, from the IBWC. We'll say the Rio Grande drains both territories. Mexico has leverage over the US because of the spatial relationship of the river to the state. It controls more of its drainage. Um, we argue that the access to abstraction or access to basically control flows of the, of the river might serve to democratize part of the, the um, governance around the Rio Grande more so than it does the Colorado River. That compounded with like extreme scarcity, this, this is a motivation uh, maybe for more cooperation. The, the juxtaposition is that the Colorado River is effectively controlled by the US. Um, we would argue a mechanism of accountability isn't built into the geography of the country's relationship to the river. So Mexico cannot control flows along the Colorado, Colorado River. The US is not dependent on Mexico for delivery of flows from the Colorado River. So it has very little power. And the US can effectively thwart Mexican access, um, creating like a spatial and environmental injustice. Um, I think that's it for me, and I'll pass it to Melissa. Thank you, Corey. So for my section, I'm going to talk about some theories as to why countries are inclined to cooperate or not. So we start off with Lejano and Shankar. And the first point that we found was that they highlight the importance of viewing the issue of water scarcity. Sorry using a contextualist approach to policy analysis. So when engaging in policy formation, policymakers tend to work using a de facto, rational, and objective method of policies. 
characteristics of institutions are emphasized over the effects of governance itself. The process of decision making is shaped by institutions that are influenced by political culture, power relations, and preferences in thinking. And then the second point is diachtomy between conflict and cooperation along the Rio Grande and Colorado rivers are managed by the same, I'm sorry, excuse me, and Colorado rivers managed by same commission requires contextual analysis of policy and outcomes to understand relative successes and failures. So in other words, there are specific goals on the agendas of each stakeholder. Oh, sorry. Uh, for instance, the Rio Grande River and the Colorado River. What is experienced on the American section of the Rio Grande may differ from the Mexican side of the river due to economic factors, local governance, and social ties, just to name a few. And the third point is rules that govern policy are place specific, flexible, and flexible, meaning that they are constantly being remade and reworked continually. There may be a lack of shared meaning in regards to what the, geog the geographical area signifies to each country based on the difference in the histories experienced by both countries. You can change it, please. So furthermore, uh, we use Baker's argument of privatization which states that privatization of water causes a superficial relationship between the resource and humans. As a result, there is an appropriation of water where humans artificially separate themselves from their natural environment in order to fit the neo-capitalist idea. This abstraction from cultural context results in the creation of the production of material life where humans use natural resources to produce goods that are seen as essential to our means of human life. The process of privatization requires the implementation of policies that will allow certain activities to take place which can help with the production of a commodity. As a result, water becomes a private good versus a public resource and this abstraction of cultural or public significance of river water strengthens a dominant trope in media around water conflict and scarcity. Water scarcity is a fight over property between two nations that can only result in conflict around the fight to possess water resources. The second is Smith's argument of power dynamics and the spat spatial environmental justice by you and Soha. Uh, needed to understand transboundary water governance, failure, and successes in the face of scarcity. As a consequence of capitalism, there is an increase in the amount of environmental degradation in exchange for profits that can be extracted from nature, which creates increased scarcity of the natural resource. In regards to the Colorado River, there is an issue of power which influences countries like the United States and Mexico to seek profit and investment from areas such as the Rio Grande River, where they are able to extract surplus value of goods. The U.S. becomes overarchingly powerful in regards to having control over the geography of the Colorado River. In contrast, Mexico does not possess much power along the Colorado River and instead depends on the delivery of water from U.S. as an act of goodwill. Can you change it, please? Let me see. Oh, sorry, can you go back? I forgot a point. Um, moreover, governments do not give people the same opportunity when it comes to the decisions that are taken on a private corporate level, meaning that there is room for exploitation. Oftentimes, the well-being of locals tend to be put at the end of the conversation when engaging in policy making among countries, causing confusion among locals and heated conversations. There may be groups of people who live within the area and utilize these rivers for their daily functions, but do not possess sufficient political power on a corporate to own such an area. So as a result, they may trespass the legal boundaries of their respected country of origin and enter boundaries of another country. So those are the problems. However, and this is where the dion diochtomy kicks in, 
the U.S. and Mexico benefit from working in, in, the, in the international sphere when it comes to managing the Rio Grande and Colorado River in a conjunctive partnership among both countries. Since water is regarded as a scarce resource in the Southwest, environmental protection transforms into a commodity. Since it is presumably harder to obtain water due to its limited supply, the price for this item increases in the market, thus transforming water into a valuable product. There are policies set in place that determine the price for water. Okay, we can change it now. So in conclusion, we have, um, it's gonna be summarized in four points. The first one is that conflict and cooperation exist simultaneously between US and Mexico, given the examples that were previously stated. The second point uh, by Corey, um, and then um, the second point would be analytical tools of conflict, cooperation, continuum and relation contextual politics should replace rational or institutional inquiries. As stated by geographer Edward Soha, there are fair and equitable distribution in space of socially valued resources and opportunities to use them. We argue that Mexico and US share more of Rio Grande than Colorado because of spatial justice built into the relationship of each state to river. And then the last point is that scarcity is an opportunity to increase democratic engagement in water governance. Institutional mechanisms should be theorized and enacted to ma maximize de democratic accountability and the cooperative sharing of international water resources. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys. I like that last slide there with the copious um, <laughs> courses. That was. <laughs> yeah. Well, all three groups um, did a great job, and let's talk a little bit about this third presentation, and then maybe we'll have a little bit of a, a wrap up here. So the, the geographic argument is compelling. Um, of course, I'm biased as a geographer, um, but um, I'm wondering if there might be something more simple, uh, perhaps, that work here, and, and maybe you have discussed it or considered it. Um, we've got two countries and we've got two rivers. And geopolitically, is it possible that the two countries are using the rivers um, in a, in a in, in a competitive or conflictive way um, to, to balance maybe power dynamics. What, what I'm getting at is if Mexico has greater control over the, uh, the, the Rio Grande because of the fact that it has greater control of the water resources, could it be that the US then sees the Colorado River as a, an opportunity to exact some sort of political price from the US here, that we've got this, this tension or this dynamic. Uh, if Mexico has greater say on what goes on along the Rio Grande, then we're going to exercise our power over the Colorado. So it's more of a dialectic sort of tension. Is that reasonable or am I, Am, am I stating something that's just maybe overly simplistic and naive? I, I don't know if it's correct, but I guess like the reason why they tend not to go to war with each other is because they have access to land. So like a problem would arise, um, I guess, if one side didn't have enough land and they wanted to take over the other, which would cause more like, I guess, power conflict. Go ahead. But this, this isn't so much uh, an issue of, of land. It's an issue of access to, access to resources. And if, if you have a very zero-sum geopolitical mentality, 
you would look at the two rivers as being uh, chips or stakes to play in a game. And when your opponent has greater control over one of those chips, you then exercise greater control over the other chip that you have more control over. So it's this dialectic or tension between the two countries that gets played out over the two river basins, in a sense. Um, again, this is kind of naive, it's kind of simplistic, but I think often policymakers um, work uh, on that level. Um, I think our current president very much sees the world in, in that way. You know, you take this, I'm going to take that. You take 10, I'm going to take 20, right? And you've got this very uh, the propensity, I think, to, um, to generate uh, this kind of tension. I don't know, Corey, you know this, yeah, you know this. I would say that that is relational. And like, you, you couldn't explain that that tension without a relational perspective on the, the, the states and the two rivers. Right, I so agree. For sure. So if anything, hopefully we just can help pave the way for a more holistic kind of mapping of the poker game, like you're saying. Yeah. So, so, so what that leads me to then is that the relational is taking place at the scale of the the communities or the base the basin itself right so you've got Juarez and you've got El Paso two cities large cities that have to share the river and you've got a relationship there of cooperation but there's also a set of relational um, processes taking place at a different scale and those that that's sort of what I'm getting at here the relational is kind of um, uh, there's a, there's a geography to the relational as well, I guess. It's like scale dependent. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. got it. Okay, got it. good.